The Ultimate Delusion by Stephen Ames Queen Elizabeth controls and has amended U.S. Social Security as follows. SI 1997, number 1778, the Social Security, the United States of America, Order 1997, made the 22nd of July in 1997, coming to force the 1st of September 1997. Alright, and I'll leave you a couple of links to the uh, APFN web pages on that. At the court of Buckingham Palace, the 22nd day of July, 1997, now, therefore, Her Majesty and pursuance of Section 179-1A and 2 of the Social Security Administration Act of 1992 and all other powers enabling her in that behalf is pleased by and with advice of her privy council to order, and it is hereby ordered as follows. This order may be cited as the Social Security, the United States of America, Order 1997, and shall come into force on the 1st of September, 1997. Does this give a new meaning to the federal judge William Wayne's justice stating in court that he takes his orders from England? This order goes on to redefine the words in the Social Security Act and make some changes in United States law. Remember King George was the arch-treasurer and Prince Elector of the Holy Roman Empire, and C, and of the United States of America, C, Treaty of Peace, 1783, 8, U.S. Statutes at Large, 80, Great Britain, which is the agent for the Pope, is in charge of the USA. Did you hear me, folks? What people do not know is <clears throat> that the so-called Founding Fathers and King George were working hand in hand to bring the people of America to their knees, to install a central government over them, and to bring them to a debt that could not be paid. First off, you have to understand that the United States is a corporation, and that it existed before the Revolutionary War. See Republica v. Swears, 1 Dallas, 43, and 28 U.S.C., 3,215. The United States is not a landmass. It is a corporation. Now you also have to realize that King George was not just the King of England. He was also the King of France. The Treaty of Peace, U.S. 8 Statutes at Large 80. On January 22, 1783, Congress ratified the contract for the repayment of 21 loans that the United States had already received dating from February 28, 1778 to July 5, 1782. Now the United States, Inc. owes the King money, which is due January 1, 1788, from King George via France. King George funded both sides of the Revolutionary War. You hear me, folks? King George funded both sides of the Revolutionary War. You know I make videos about this all the time. I just want you to re I just want you to hear it from someone else. Now the Articles of Confederation, which were declared in force March 1st, 1781, states in Article 12, all bills of credit emitted monies borrowed and debts contracted by or under the authority of Congress before the assembling of the United States in pursuance of the present Confederation shall be deemed and considered a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction whereof the said United States and the public faith are hereby solemnly pledged. Do you understand that, folks? You got to pay it back no matter what. You, you were a part of it or not. What? You got to pay it back whether you were a part of it or not. What? I said you got what 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 the articles of confederation acknowledge the debt owed to King George now after losing the revolutionary war <laughs> even though the war was nothing more than a move to turn the people into into debtors for the king the conquest was not yet complete now the loans were coming due, and so a meeting was convened in Annapolis, Maryland, to discuss the economic instability of the country under the Articles of Confederation. Only five states come to the meeting, but there is a call for another meeting to take place in Philadelphia the following year, with the express purpose of revising the Articles of the Confederation on February 21, 1787. 
Congress gave approval of the meeting to take place in Philadelphia on May 14, 1787, to revise the Articles of Confederation. Something had to be done about the mounting debt. Little did the people know that the so-called Founding Fathers were going to reorganize the United States because it was bankrupt. On September 17, 1787, 12 states delegates approved the Constitution. The states have now become constitutors. A constitutor in the civil law, one who by simple agreement becomes responsible for the payment of another's debt. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition. The states were now liable for the debt owed to the king, but the people of America were not because they were not a party to the Constitution because it was never put to them for a vote. And I'll leave you a link to the APFN webpage on that. On August 4th, 1790, the act was passed which was titled An Act Making Provision for the Payment of the Debt of the United States. This can be found at 1 U.S. Statutes at Large, pages 138 through 178. This act, for all intents and purposes, abolished the states and credited the districts. If you don't believe it, look it up. The act set up federal districts. Here in Pennsylvania, we got two. In this act, each district was assigned a portion of the debt. The next step was for the states to recognize their government which most did in 1790. This had to be done because the states needed to legally bind the people to the debt. The original state constitutions were never submitted to the people for a vote. So the governments wrote new constitutions and submitted them to people for a vote, thereby binding the people to the debts owed to Great Britain. The people became citizens of the state which they resided and ipso facto, a citizen of the United States. A citizen is a member of a fictional entity and is synonymous with subject. What you think is a state is, in reality, a corporation. In other words, a person, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is person. 9F, sub 272, word person does not include state. 12 OP Eternal General 176. There are no states, just corporations. Every body politic on this planet is a corporation. A corporation is an artificial entity, a fiction at law. They only exist in your mind. They are images in your mind that speak to you. We labor, pledge our property, and give our children to a fiction. For an in-depth look into the nature of these corporations and to see how you have been declared a fictional entity, see American Law and Procedure, Jurisprudence and Legal Institutions, Volume 13, by James DeWitt Andrews, LLB, Albany Law School, LLD, Ruskin University, from La Salle University. This book explains in detail the nature and purpose of these corporations you will be stunned at what you read. Now before we go any further, let's examine a few things in the Constitution. Article 6, Section 1 keeps the loans from the king valid. It states, all debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. Another interesting tidbit can be found at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 2, which states that Congress has the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. This was needed so the United States, excuse me, the United States, uh, which went into bankruptcy on January 1st, 1788, could borrow money and then because of the states were a party to the Constitution, they would also be liable for it. The next underhanded move was the creation of the United States Bank in 1791. This was a private bank of which there were 25,000 shares issued, of which 18,000 were held by those in England. Um, the bank loaned the United States money in exchange for securities of the United States. Now, the creditor of the United States, which included the king, wanted paid the interest on the loans that were given to the United States. So Alexander Hamilton came up with the great idea of taxing alcohol. 
The people resisted, so George Washington set out the militia to collect the tax, which they did. This had become known as the Whiskey Rebellion. It is the militia's duty to collect taxes. How did the United States collect taxes off the people if they are not a party to the Constitution? I'll tell you how. The people are slaves. The United States belongs to the Founding Fathers, their posterity, and Great Britain. America is nothing more than a plantation, folks. It always has been. How many times uh, have you seen someone in court attempting to use the Constitution and the judge tells them he can't? It's because you're not a party to it. We are slaves. If you don't believe, read Paddleford, Fay and Company versus the mayor and alderman <laughs> of the city of Savannah, 14, Georgia. Uh, page uh, or 438, uh, 520, which states, But indeed, no private person has the right to complain by suit in court on the ground of breach of constitution. The constitution, it is true, is a compact, but he is not a party to it. Now back to the militia. Just read Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, which states that it is the militia's job to execute the laws of the Union. Now read Clause 16, which states that Congress has the power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them which may be employed in the service of the United States. The militia is not there to protect you and me. It is their duty to collect our substance. As you can plainly see, all the Constitution did is set up a military government to guard the king's commerce and make us slaves. If one goes to 8 U.S. statutes at large, 116 through 132, you will find the Treaty of Amity, Commerce and Navigation. This treaty was signed on November 19, 1794, which was 12 years after the war. Article 2 of the treaty states that the king's troops were still occupying the United States. Being the nice king that he was, he decided that the troops would return to England by June 1, 1796. The troops were still on American soil because, quite frankly, the king wanted them there. Many people tend to blame the Jews for our problems, but they too are for the most part also slaves. Jewish law does, however, govern the entire world, as found in Jewish law by Menachem Elohim. Deputy President, Supreme Court of Israel. To wit, everything in the Babylonian Talmud is binding on all Israel. Every town and country must follow all customs, give effect to the decrees, and, and carry out the enactment of the Talmud. The practices rendered the decisions and derived the laws constituted all or most of the sages of Israel. It is they who received the tradition of the fundamentalists of the entire Torah and unbroken succession going back to Moses, our teacher. We are living under what the Bible calls mammon. As written in the subject index, mammon is defined as civil law and procedure. Turn to the Shittar's effect on English law. A law of the Jews becomes law of the land, found in the Georgetown Law Journal, volume 71, pages 1179 to 1200. It is clearly stated in the Law Review that the Jews are the property of the Norman and Anglo-Saxon kings. <laughs> it explains how the Babylonian Talmud became the law of the land, which is now known as the Uniform Commercial Code, which is private international law. The written credit agreement, the Jewish Shatar, is a lien on all the property in the world. <laughs> uh, the treaties also explain that the Jews are owned by Great Britain and that the Jews are in charge of the banking system. We are living under the Babylonian Talmud. It was brought into England in 1066 and has been enforced by the Pope, kings, and the various religions ever since. It is total and relentless mind control. 
People are taught to believe in things that do not exist. Private international law, which is only commercial law, only deals with fictions known as persons. A person is a fictional entity at law, not a living being. See UCC 1-201. Now before you scream that the UCC is unconstitutional, I'm sorry people, you are not a party to any constitution. Read the case site below. But indeed, no private person has the right to complain by suit in court on the ground of a breach of the Constitution. The Constitution, it is true, is a compact, but he is not a party to it. Paddleford Fay and Company versus Mayor and Adelman of the city of Savannah, blah, blah, blah. You have to understand that, that Great Britain, Article 6, Section 1, the United States and the states are the parties to the Constitution, not you. All right? the states are that you're not <laughs> let me try to explain if I buy an automobile from a man that and that automobile has a warranty and the engine blows up on the first day I have it and I tell the man uh, just forget about it then you come along and tell the man to pay me and he says no so you take him to court for not holding up the contract the court then says case dismissed why because you're not a party to the contract you cannot sue a government official for not adhering to a contract constitution that you are not a party to you better accept the fact that you are a slave when you try to use the constitution you are committing a crime known as criminal trespass why because you are attempting to infringe on a private contract that you are not a party to then to make matters worse uh, you are a debt slave who owns no property or has any rights. You're a mere user of your master's property. Here are just a couple of examples. The primary control and custody of infants is with the government. Tillman versus Roberts, 108 SO62. Marriage is a civil contract to which there are three parties, the husband, the wife, and the state. Van Cotton v. Van Cotton. 154 NE 146. The ultimate ownership of all property is in the state. Individual so called ownership is only by virtue of government, i.e., law, amounting to mere user. And use must be in accordance with law and subordinate to the necessities of the state. Senate document number 43, the 73rd Congress, first section, Brown v. Welch Supra. You own no property because you are a slave. Really, you are worse off than a slave because you are also a debtor. The right of the traffic on the transmission of property, an absolute inalienable right, is one which has never existed since governments were instituted and never can exist under government. Weinhammer v. The People, 13 New York Representative 378481. Great Britain to this day collects taxes from the American people. The IRS is not an agency of the United States government. Okay, folks, see APFN webpage, and I'll link you on that one. All taxpayers have an individual master file which is in code by using the IRS publication 6209, which is over 400 pages. There is a blocking series which shows the taxpayer the type of tax that is being paid. Most taxpayers fall under a 300 to a 399 um, blocking series, which 6209 states is, re is reserved. But by going to um, the BMF 300 through 399, which is the business master file in 6209 prior to 1991, this was U.S. U.K. tax claims, meaning taxpayers are considered business and involved in commerce and are held liable for taxes via the treaty between the US and the UK payable to the UK okay uh, the form that is supposed to be used for for this form um, 8288 okay that's the form that's supposed to be used um, for this form the um, 80, 8288 FIRPTA the foreign investment uh, real property tax account that's what it is the 8288 form is the law enforced manual of the IRS chapter 3. The OMB's paper office of management and budget in the Department of Treasury list of archives information collectives approved under Paperwork Reduction Act is where form 8288 is found under 
OMB number 1545-0902, which says U.S. withholding tax return for disposition by foreign persons of U.S. form number 8288-8288A. Okay, these codes have since been changed to read as follows. IMF 300 through 309, barred assessment, CP 55, generated valid for MFT-30, which is the code for the 1040 form. You guys, a lot of you probably already knew that. The IMF 310 through 399 reads the same. The IMF 310 through 399 reads the same as the IMF 300 through 309, uh, the BMF. 390 and 399 reads US UK tax treaty claims. Isn't it incredible that a 1040 form is a payment of tax to the UK? Everybody is always looking to the 26 USC for the law that makes one liable for the so called income tax. But it's not there because it's not a tax. <laughs> it is a debt collection through a private contract called the Constitution of the United States, Article 6, Section 1, and various agreements. All right. Is a cow paying an income tax when the machine gets connected to its udders? The answer is no. I have never known a cow to own property, or has it ever been compensated for its labor that I know of. You own nothing that your labor has ever produced. <laughs> you don't even own your labor or yourself, okay? I'm not going to cry. I told myself I'm not going to cry. Your labor is measured in current credit money, which is debt. You are allowed to retain a small portion of your labor so that you can have food, clothing, shelter, and most of all, breed more slaves. You see, we are cows. The IRS is, company, is the company who milks us. <laughs> And the United States, Inc., is the veterinarian who takes care of the herd. And Great Britain is the owner of the farm. In fee simple. The farm is held in Aladium by the Pope. Now the picture will become much clearer after reading the next few paragraphs. We will now show the Pope's involvement in the scheme of things. Convinced that the principles of religion contribute most powerfully to keep the nations in the state of passive obedience to which they owe to their princes. The high contracting parties declare it to be their intention to sustain in their respective states those measures which clergy may adopt with the aim of ameliorating the interest so intimately connected with the preservation of the authority of the princes and their contracting powers join in offering their thanks to the Pope for what he has already done for them, and solicit his constant cooperation in their views of submitting the nations. Article 3, Treaty of Verona, 1822. If the sovereign pontiff should nevertheless insist on his law being observed, he must be obeyed. Bend 14, Descend Dioc, L.I.B., I X C V I I in for Prati 1844. Pontifical laws, moreover, become obligatory without being accepted or confirmed by secular rulers. Syllabus Prop 28-29-44. Hence the just national federal law. Or the exceptional ecclesiastical laws relevant in the United States, may be abolished at any time by the Sovereign Pontiff. Elements of Ecclesiastic Law, Volume 1, page 53-54. So, could this be shown that the Pope rules the world? Um, anyway, the Pope Fucker of Christ, Christ. claims to be the ultimate owner of everything in the world. See Treaty of 1213. Papal Bulls of 1455 and 1492. All right. Don't let this information alarm you. Without it, you can't be free. You have to understand that all slavery and freedom originates from the mind. When your mind allows you to accept and understand that the United States, Great Britain, and the Vatican are corporations which are nothing but fictional entities which have been placed into your mind, you'll understand that our slavery is because we believe in fictions. 
the end.